Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you out on Palm Sunday morning. Palm Sunday, the time when we begin to turn our attention and our focus towards remembering the death of Jesus and celebrating his resurrection. Our text today is fitting. It's appropriate because it's about keeping a focus on the resurrection, not um, just the historical resurrection of Jesus, but rather the future resurrection that every believer in Christ will experience on the last day. Jesus was the first, and we celebrate His resurrection because His resurrection provides the promise that we too one day will experience that as well. It provides the power that allows us to believe that one day we too will experience resurrection and live with Christ forever. Now, last week, Jeff took us through the first 11 verses of chapter 3, where Paul reminded us that knowing Christ, both now and in the future resurrection, is worth more than anything that we could have, worth more than anything that we could accomplish in this present life. In Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11, he said this. He said, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. You see, nothing we do, nothing we can accomplish on our own, nothing that we would put down on our life resume can compare to the riches, the value, the blessing of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord. Now, as a point of clarification, in today's passage, when Paul speaks about knowing Christ, he's not talking about becoming a Christian. He's writing as someone who already knows the Lord, who is a believer, but someone who wants a deeper, more meaningful relationship with Christ. He's saying, I know you, Lord, but I want to really know you. I want to be so identified with you. I want my life to be about knowing you. Paul wants to know the joy and power of sharing the gospel of the kingdom of God the same way Jesus did. Paul wants to experience God's power at work in and through him. Paul even wants to suffer the same way that Jesus suffered. And he's also looking forward to the day when his earthly life will pass away And he will get to experience, along with every other believer in Christ, that glorious victory of being physically resurrected to new life in heaven with Christ forever. That's what Paul means when he speaks about knowing Christ. His focus, the context of our passage today, is one of looking forward, looking toward the reality of our own future resurrection and all that that means for us, not only in the future, but today as well. Because what we hope for, what we long for in the future, it changes the way we live our lives today. So Paul says that knowing Christ is the ultimate prize. Pursuing Him is the ultimate endeavor. So if knowing Christ is the ultimate goal of life, a full experiential, unhindered, unobstructed knowledge of Christ, if that's the goal, then how do we go about achieving it? Our text today is going to answer that question. So I invite you to open your Bibles. We're in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 12 and go through chapter 4, verse 1. And I'd invite you to stand as we read God's Word, starting in verse 12 of chapter 3. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I press on, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I often told you and now tell you even with tears, 
walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Heavenly Father, thank You for this day that we can gather together. Thank You for this holy week where we can remember Your love for us, Your commitment to us, Your death, and most importantly, Your resurrection to newness of life. And God, we pray that in these next minutes, what is true and right from your word would lodge in our hearts and minds, that we would be changed the way you would want us to be changed, that you would be honored and that we would be blessed by our time together with you today, we pray in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. So, if pursuing and knowing Christ is the ultimate endeavor and ultimate goal of life, if our citizenship is indeed in heaven and we want to arrive home joyful, intact, and unashamed, If we hope to get to the end of this life with a rich and growing knowledge of Christ, what does it take? Well, in Paul's letter to the Philippians and in God's word to us today, we're shown two indispensable things, two things necessary to enjoy a growing knowledge of God. First, we need the right attitude, and then we need to do the right things, the right actions. So that's what we're going to look at this morning, the proper attitude and the proper actions for a life lived in pursuit of the knowledge of God. Now, this description that Paul gives of his own attitude, it's not just a biographical tidbit, it's a part of God's holy word because it's an attitude that we, too, are to have. Let's look at verse 15. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. Your translation might say, let us have the same attitude. But let those of us who are mature think this way And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. What he's telling us is there's really only one attitude, one way of thinking, one perspective that we must have if we want to be mature in our relationship with God. And there are three aspects to having that right attitude necessary to gain a full knowledge of God. First of all, our attitude should be one of humility, humble enough to know that we haven't arrived yet humble enough to know that we'll never fully arrive this side of the resurrection. And that's how Paul begins. He says, beginning in 12, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. Because when it comes to a complete knowledge of God, Paul is saying, I I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. I too live by faith. I too struggle with the realities of life in a sinful body, in a sinful and fallen world. Maybe like myself, you've read your Bible and sometimes you've thought, man, I could never be like Paul. He's so spiritual. He's got such a close walk with God. I couldn't be like him because he was different. He was special. Now, Paul might have been special, but he wasn't different. He was a man with struggles and fears. He too had frustrations. He didn't live on some elevated spiritual plane that's unobtainable for regular Christians like you and me. No, in fact, he lived according to the same Word of God and he lived by the power of the same Holy Spirit that indwells us today. And he hadn't yet arrived at a complete knowledge of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul wrote this. He said, for now we see in a mirror dimly but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, just as I have been fully known. You see, he's talking about the common Christian experience and the current knowledge that we would have of God. Trying to get a clear, full picture of God's like looking at a dim reflection in a really old, bad mirror. The King James Version puts it this way. It says it's like looking through a glass darkly. It's like when you're out on a hike and maybe you go by a, an old abandoned mine site and you, you see a piece of broken glass and it's blue glass. And you go, oh, that's pretty cool. Now that must have been here a long time. And you pick it up and of course you look through it because it's an interesting piece of blue glass and everything's just uh, a little out of shape, uh, not very clear, a little distorted. 
And that's like our view of God from where we sit today. We're not getting a full, clear picture of Christ in this life. But one day after the final resurrection, we will see him face to face. We will know him just as we are fully known by him. Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul reminds us, he says, for we, that includes Paul, you and me, we walk by faith, not by sight. Paul hadn't arrived at a full understanding of Christ, and we haven't either. So if we want to know Christ, we must begin with the realization that we've still got a long way to go. While some may know Christ better than others, none of us have reached a point where we can say, oh, I'm good. I know enough about God. I don't need to pursue Him any further. We've all got more to learn, and we have so much more to experience with Christ. There will come a day when we will see Him face to face, but as for now, we haven't seen or experienced the full picture. So our attitude begins with a humble recognition of how much farther we each have to go. Secondly, our attitude, our perspective must be forward-focused, looking to the future, an attitude that forgets what's behind us and looks forward to what's ahead. Paul continues, he says, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. It's the one thing he does. He forgets what lies behind and he presses on. And our lives should be the same. Now, Paul's not asking us to forget everything that happened yesterday. He's not saying that the past is meaningless. And he's certainly not telling us to forget all the good things that God has done in the past. The Bible often encourages us to remember consistently and to celebrate God's mighty and gracious deeds of the past. But from the context of this whole chapter, the obvious things that lie behind for Paul were the things from his pre-Christian life which he thought would gain him favor with God, the things that ultimately were rubbish compared to knowing Christ, his earthly religious resume, which we talked about last week. The things we are to forget are also the things that we thought earned us points with God, things that tempted us to consider that maybe we finally arrived already with God. Now these things in and of themselves, they may have been, and they probably were really good things, but instead of clinging to what we've done in the past as our calling card for our knowledge of Jesus today, we should put our focus on what God is doing in and through us now. If I'm to grow in my relationship with Christ, if my goal is to know Him more, then I can't coast today relying on the things that I did yesterday We've all, if we've walked with Christ, we've done some good things, wonderful things in pursuit of Christ. We've learned and we've grown, and there's been plenty in the past to be excited about, but yesterday, it's behind us. And today, we must press on to something that is new and something fresh in our walk with God. You know, I, I believe it's a common temptation to think that maybe we've, we've already done enough, we've already paid our dues for getting to know Jesus. Maybe rather than looking forward, you're tempted to look back. I'm personally pretty familiar with that temptation. I struggle with that sometimes. Now, again, we should celebrate the good things God has done in and through us, but our faithful obedience yesterday doesn't excuse us from faithful obedience today. Remember that first attitude, we haven't arrived, but forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what is ahead, that means that what you choose to do in pursuit of Christ today is of much more immediate concern than anything you did yesterday. Now there's another side of this admonition to forget what lies behind. He's saying that for the Christian, my life today, my standing with God today, isn't determined by what happened yesterday. And that's an important principle for a fruitful and faithful Christian life, especially when it concerns our own sin or the negative and harmful things that we might have experienced because of the sin of others. God's desire to love us today and our ability to pursue and connect with God today is not determined by what happened yesterday. I believe we're all too familiar with the knowledge that bad things from our past have a horrible way of creeping into and trying to destroy our present. It might be something bad that you did. It might be something bad that was done to you. And the more you remember that, the more you dwell on events from your past, the more those bad memories try to define and try to hinder you from fully experiencing God today. 
Paul himself had plenty of bad things that could have crippled his pursuit of God. Paul used to persecute Christians. There was a time when he was happy to see Christians put to death. I'm sure that these are the things also that Paul was willing to forget because they were a hindrance to him moving forward in pursuit of God. Now, when I was in college at the University of Texas, I was involved in the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ. Now it's called Crew. And um, one of the, the crew staff was a guy named Hank. And every time that he spoke, taught a Bible study, taught a lesson, he would end the same way. Now, he was talking to college students at a huge secular campus where uh, the opportunities for making bad moral choices were in, just numerous. So he would always end this way with this phrase. He said, if you only remember one thing from tonight, remember this. God loves you. You can never do anything so bad that God can't forgive you. And it's never too late to start doing the right thing. He said, if you remember this one thing, and actually it's three things, right? God loves you. You can never do anything so bad that God can't forgive you. And it's never too late to do the right thing. And that's true. And it's something that we should all remember. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what God has for me in the future. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, it's never too late to turn to Jesus and receive his love and forgiveness. And indeed, it's God's grace and it's his forgiveness of our sin that allows us to forget the things that lie behind. So if we want to pursue Christ, if we want to gain a a deeper knowledge of, of God, the right attitude, it first begins with humility. Secondly, it has a forward focus that forgets what's behind and looks forward to what's ahead. But thirdly, we have to have an attitude of perseverance in our pursuit of the knowledge of Christ. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now the language from this sentence, it's straight out of the sports page, is the language of competition, the language of the games. The image here is of athletic endeavor and achievement. He's talking about driving to the finish line, pressing toward the goal, straining to make it. And if you're serious about running fast, the first thing you learn is don't turn around and look at who's behind you or who's next to you. That just slows you down. You've got to keep your focus on the finish line and move toward it as fast as you can. Paul's pretty fired up here in this sentence. He describes his pursuit of God like an athlete, an Olympic athlete going for the gold. And he emphasizes this point for a good reason. And that's because God always responds to those who pursue him. The prophet Hosea wrote this, Hosea chapter 6. He said, after two days, he will revive us. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn. And he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. So here we have this prophetic picture of the resurrection of Christ. And a picture that that resurrection would make it possible for us to live together with God. So because God's made it possible, we should confidently press on to know him. And just like you can count on the sun coming up every morning, just the same way that you can count on plenty of snow and rain in April in Colorado, you can count on God being faithful to his word. This promise is repeated again in James chapter 4, verse 8. He says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God is faithful. God always responds to those who pursue him. When we move toward God, God will move toward us. And knowing that to be the case, and it is the case, Paul says, I'm running toward God full speed ahead. Now, we're not Olympic athletes. We're mostly ordinary Christian people who go to school. We go to work. We raise children. We go to the grocery store. We cut the grass on Saturday. Paul's attitude, it might sound a bit dramatic compared to my everyday experience, but here's something that we can do. Here's what it can look like for us. Each day, we should focus some energy 
on growing our faith, we should focus some energy on moving one step closer to Jesus. God saved me and he saved you for an eternal purpose. And we should invest something in moving closer to that purpose every day. Pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God means regardless of what I did yesterday, I'm choosing to do something today that's meaningful, something that's a little life-changing in my relationship with Christ. Regardless of what I did yesterday, I'm choosing to do something today that is meaningful and life-changing in my relationship with Christ. You know, and that does take an attitude of perseverance. Life is long and life is hard, and there are many lessons and experiences that God has planned for us. Remember that Paul wrote these words after he'd already spent years in prison, never knowing from one day to the next, will this be the day that I'm set free, or is this the day that I'm taken to execution? But we know that whatever our present circumstance, God's redemptive power is at work in our lives. And so we continue to press forward. Like Paul, we adopt the attitude that in the midst of suffering, in the midst of uncertainty, we continue to move toward God. You know, this pursuit of Christ, this lifelong pursuit, it's kind of like going on a long road trip. You know how it is. Everybody piles into the car. Everybody's excited because they're off on a great trip. Maybe it's a trip to grandma's house. Maybe it's a trip to Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. But you know it's going to be a long trip. But you also know that your destination is a good one and you can't wait to get there. And as everyone gets in the car, you notice that all the seats are pointed forward so everyone can see where the car is going. In fact, the front windshield, it's the biggest piece of glass in the car. It's about six feet wide. It's two and a half, maybe three feet tall. It gives you an unobstructed view of where you're going and what's to come. Now, there's a second piece of glass, and it's a smaller one. It's about six to eight inches wide and maybe two to three inches tall. It's a rearview mirror, and it's useful for glancing back Every now and again, you take a glance back to where you've been. But if your destination is a great one, where you've been is meaningless compared to where you're going. And your kids know this because they're consumed with the prospect of getting to the destination. Everybody's asking, how much longer? How much farther till we get there? Nobody's asking, hey, how far have we come? Where did we come from? How long till we get there? And you know, nothing puts a downer on the trip more than somebody saying, couldn't we just spend instead the whole vacation, couldn't we go back and spend it on the slide in the little jungle gym at Chick-fil-A where we had lunch rather than pressing on towards Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. And at times that road trip's going to feel long, really long, but the goal is worth it so you continue to press on, knowing that you haven't arrived until you've actually really arrived. So a living and experiential knowledge of Christ, that's the greatest achievement in life. And it starts with the right attitude. An attitude that says, well, I'm not there yet, but forgetting what lies behind, I'm focused and I'm determined to keep driving toward a richer, deeper knowledge of Christ. So Paul's shown us the right attitude for growing in the knowledge of Christ. And now he's going to show us the right methodology, the right actions. Now that my attitude is right, what am I supposed to do? Well, Paul says, if you want to experience the fullness of walking with Christ, Paul says, do what I do. In verse 13, he says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Because there is an example, there's a pattern, there's a rhythm, there's a path to follow when it comes to the Christian life. As Jeff has often said, Jesus isn't out to make you a deal. Jesus is the deal. You see, we don't get to set our own rules in the Christian life. We don't have the freedom to make it up as we go along. We learn what the example and pattern of the Christian life is in two ways, by reading God's Word and by observing others who walk closely with God, by following an example, by being mentored and guided in the living out of our faith. Because the church is a community, and Paul is encouraging each of us to be in relationship with someone who's been in the faith longer, someone who may have a stronger faith, someone after whom we can pattern our own lives. 
And this is a consistent theme in the Bible. Paul's life was always a personal demonstration how to faithfully follow Christ. And he wasn't shy about telling others to follow him. In his letter to the Philippians in chapter 4, he says again, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. And in his letter to the church at Corinth, he again says the same thing two times. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, I exhort you, therefore, be imitators of me. Again in verse 11, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. So at the end of his life, Paul is saying, follow me as I follow Christ. But early on, when Paul was new to his faith, he too had someone that he could look to for guidance and encouragement. We read in the book of Acts that early on after his conversion, Barnabas came alongside Paul and was looking out for him. We see Barnabas encouraging Paul and certainly providing an example to follow. And in fact, Jesus himself taught and followed the same pattern. In John chapter 15, we see an example. Jesus speaking, he says, just as the Father has loved me, I've also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The Father loved Jesus, Jesus loved the disciples. The Father gave commands to Jesus, Jesus gave commands to his disciples. We see that the Christian life, it's lived in community with others. Maturity in Christ is not something we attain on our own. It's not something we can do apart from other people. Growth in faith and growth in the knowledge of God is always achieved through the example and the encouragement of others. Those who are farther along in their journey of faith should serve as models and guides for those that are younger in their faith. So keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Pay attention to those who are living a faithful, God-honoring life and make sure you're learning something from them along the way. Because being a disciple and making other disciples is the natural process of the Christian life. And it's most clearly stated in 2 Timothy chapter 2. The things you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust a faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now here at Southern Gables, our mission statement is advancing Jesus' life-transforming movement of disciples making disciples. And we have some programs and processes in place to make that happen. We have Sunday morning adult communities. We have life groups that meet during the week. There are also a number of smaller men's and women's Bible studies that meet. And we have a, a men's ministry. We have a women's ministry. And probably the main goal of those is to create events where people can connect with other people in the church. Men can meet other men and develop relationships where they can learn from one another. And if you're at the right time and place in life, and if you feel that God's calling you to a greater commitment, not just to being a disciple, but to being a disciple maker, we have what we call our four E groups. Disciple making is a process. And it can be broken down into four steps or four phases. And the first one is engage. Engage non-believers in a way that allows you to share the gospel with them. Because the first step to becoming a follower of Christ is, of course, hearing the gospel. Someone must become a Christian before they become a disciple. The second step is to establish believers in their faith. Teaching them how to pray, how to study the Bible, the core truths and practices of the Christian faith. And the third step is to equip them to share their faith with others. Equip believers with the training and the tools necessary to be effective in ministering. And the fourth step is to expand the church, expand the kingdom by going forth and repeating the process of engaging, establishing, and equipping others. And that's what our four E groups are about. Taking us through the process so that we can become disciple makers that are involved in this process in an ongoing way. <clears throat> the goal is that as each of us is pressing on, as each of us strives toward a better knowledge of God, we would grow to be someone that in time others could look at and say, wow, there goes someone that you should keep your eye on. There's someone who's walking according to the pattern 
of the faithful, someone that's setting a good example that others can follow as they grow in Christ. But now, in the middle of our passage, after encouraging us to follow the example set by Paul and other faithful Christians, we're presented with a very sad and somber warning. Let's look again at our text, verses 18 and 19. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Paul says many, not just a few, but many, are now walking as enemies of the cross of Christ. And how did they end up as enemies of the cross of Christ? Well, rather than pursuing a knowledge of Christ and fixing their hope on the resurrection and the new life to come, they went the opposite way. Instead of moving toward a glorious end of eternity with God, they moved toward an end that's destruction. Rather than seeking and serving the loving Creator who gave them life, They choose to make their own appetite, their own belly their God. They just seek to satiate themselves with the physical and sensual pleasures of this earthly life. Rather than holding an attitude of humble pursuit of God, they set their minds on earthly things. As Jeff so clearly pointed out two weeks ago, there's no other option for the Christian but to live a life of full allegiance to God. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Many are those who are on it. Narrow is the way that leads to life few are those who find it. In these verses, Paul's reminding us that there's a sad end for those who would pursue limited man-made temporal pleasures above the eternal, unlimited promise of God's love and blessing. And it's a necessary reminder of what happens when we take our eyes off the prize of Christ and when we seek an earthly substitute. Now, when I first began to intentionally pursue becoming a disciple of Christ, when I was a college student, The man who mentored and trained me was fond of saying, you have to remember the horror stories. And by that he meant that we must from time to time remember the stories of those who once walked in faith, but then set their minds on earthly things. He said, we can't be afraid to talk about the guy who chose to have an affair, then divorced his wife and left his children and the Lord so that he could shack up with his secretary. And we can't be afraid to talk about our friend who in pursuit of more money and more promotions at work and more accolades, kept compromising just a little bit here and a little bit there until one day he was so sold out he wouldn't even acknowledge the existence of God any longer. And those kind of choices, they always leave a wide wake of deep destruction, not only for the main perpetrator, but for all those close to them as well. That's why we need to remember them. Because sin has a way of creeping in, it has a way of trying to deceive us into thinking that a turn away from God, it just won't be that bad. Sin wants to deceive us into thinking that going back to where we once were is better than pressing forward to where Christ wants to take us. So we must, from time to time, take a sober look at how lives are destroyed when people turn away from pursuit of God to satisfy their own sinful desires. Now, there are many tragic and sad stories We all know someone who fits the description of these verses. And they should be a reminder to us of what's at stake. Now we mentioned that the church is a community and growing in faith, it can't be done alone. We have to take care of one another. In Hebrews chapter 3 it says this, Take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God but encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Take care, lest there should be in any one of you, in any one of us, an evil, unbelieving heart. We must encourage one another, not yesterday, but today. If you wake up and it's today, you should find a way to encourage a brother or sister in Christ and encourage them to continue their pursuit of the Lord. Whatever we might have done to encourage someone yesterday, it doesn't count anymore. Any day that's today should be a day that we lift up a brother or sister in Christ. Why? Because our destination is worth it. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await 
a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That truth is the overriding fact for every believer in Christ. We've become children of God. Our home is with him forever, and Jesus will change us. And because Jesus died and rose again, we too will rise again to newness of life. And that truth is the foundation for the joy that we can experience in any and all circumstances. This letter to the Philippians was written by Paul when he was on the the cusp of experiencing all that he'd been hoping for since the day when he first met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was right at the finish line, and he wrote this letter so others could follow close behind. So what does it take to know Christ, to make it to that finish line? It takes the right attitude, an attitude of humility, recognizing that the Christian life is an ongoing pursuit of the person of Christ, an ongoing knowledge and experience of all that he has planned for us. And it takes the right actions, a commitment to following the teaching and example that has been handed down through the Word and also through the living testimony of those who faithfully follow God. And the ultimate goal is to be joined with Christ forever, not in the lowly bodies we inhabit now, but in glorious new bodies like those of our risen Lord. And when we live in pursuit of that future, when we live in pursuit of that glorious hope, it changes everything about how we live in the present. You know, we look forward to heaven, hopefully in the way that we might look forward to going on vacation. Not just any vacation, the vacation of a lifetime. Something you've spent many months, maybe even years planning. You're leaving, you've got your date picked, August 10th. You've got your airline tickets, you've got your hotel suite booked with that beautiful ocean view. In anticipation of your vacation, you've even started a new diet because you want to work on your beach body. You want to be ready. You clear your work calendar for when you're gone. You make sure that things are covered because you're going to be away. You find yourself pinching pennies and saving more than usual because you'd rather save it up for then than spend it now. You buy a guidebook, you learn all you can about your destination. You plan your outings and schedule in your must-see sites. Maybe you buy a language book if you're going international. You try and learn basic phrases. And you certainly talk to your friends and you share the expectant joy of your big trip. And of course, you brag about getting such a great price on your airline tickets. But you're not on vacation yet. You still go to work each day. You drop the kids at school. You go to the grocery store. You cut the grass on Saturday. You're still in your regular routine. But the looking forward to that great vacation changes the way you think and feel and act as you wait to pack your bags and leave. The hope of what's coming gives perspective to and influences the character of how you live today. The knowledge of our future resurrection and eternity with Christ should have a similar result. Our eager expectation and our pursuit of that reality should influence, it should shape everything about how we live today. We haven't yet arrived, but may we each forget whatever hindrance lies behind and press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, John. It's a good reminder that we are looking forward. We don't have to look back.